Okay, so like I said, uh, we've got a tall order today. We're gonna get through uh, the reading if we can. Um, and I'm skipping quite a bit. So last time we were, um, let's just refresh our memory. Um, we were talking about, uh, well, we were revisiting the absurd because that's such an important um, concept or whatever you want to call it, this experience of the absurd, experience. This is central to the essay. And he's basically arguing that when we encounter the absurd, when there's this rift between ourself, you know, between the human being and its world, and the world is there, but no longer maintains its value for us, when there's this sort of alienation from meaning, this is the absurd. Camus wants us to maintain this rupture and engage in the world, still engage in it, but also sort of acknowledging the absurdity of our engagement. This is quite unconventional, I suppose, because for him, the conventional response to this feeling of absurdity uh, is, I guess, the, the really morbid response would be just to off ourselves, to kill ourselves. Uh, and then after that would be hope. And he doesn't like either one of these, okay? He wants to find some reason for living, but he doesn't want to, to pin that meaning on some story or narrative, some false hope. Because he thinks that's ultimately the only thing that we do. When we engage in the world and we go, we start caring about our career, our, you know, our family, anything, that's, for him, that's something that could be annihilated at any moment. That is something that could be taken from us at any moment. And so we have to sort of always keep that in mind. And I don't know, I'm, I'm starting to think that maybe I'm, I'm, I'm giving him an unfair shake here. I've been thinking about this the last few days and I feel like I'm a bit of a hypocrite because as much as I, I try to like diss him and tell him tell you guys that this is such an evil, dangerous essay and it's horrible advice, I gotta say, I kind of live this way myself. <laughs> I'm not a very religious person. Um, I've had several dreams that have been broken and I'm kind of at this point in my life, so I think this is kind of a personal confession, where I'm kind of like, you know, for me to be critical of him is kind of hypocritical. You know, I'm sort of like, I guess this is kind of how I live my life. I think the reason I'm critical is I just don't think that everybody can live this way. I think that you just, you know, this is not the kind of advice that, I think some people just, they need to have something to latch on to, some hope, right? Um, and I mean, it, it really is depressing when I tell people this because they, they just feel sorry for me. And I'm like, I'm coping with it. But I'm, I, I literally have no hope in the future. Like, I'm just here having fun. I'm just, I, I try to be a good person and not screw people over. I obviously care about what I do for a living. I love what I do. But I remember when I first started teaching, I was just like, very like, I'm gonna change education. I'm gonna like, you know, become a, a I, I, cause I do think that the educational system is completely fucked. I think you kids are getting screwed out of an education. I think K through 12 is just a bunch of mindless brainwashing that just destroys your imagination and, and makes you a hollow human being that's not capable of dealing with the world. But I thought I could change that. And now I'm just like, I think it's just, you know, I'm a mosquito and it's a windshield, uh, but what am I gonna do, right? I'm like gonna, no, I'm gonna hate myself and like sulk in my own misery. No, I'm like, well, I'm gonna have fun. I'm gonna enjoy myself, have maybe teach you guys some things and maybe you'll get something out of it and try not to take things so serious, I guess. But I think for some people, they, they have to have some, there's gotta be something solid for them to stand on or they are they're gonna slip, right? And for me, I've just given up on that. I'm like, <laughs> there's nothing solid and I'm just gonna enjoy what I can enjoy and, and take, take life as I can and sort of, I guess like Vonnegut's advice, right? Whenever things are nice, recognize it, right? You know, isn't it nice? That kind of thing. You know, so in a way, as, as much as I diss him, I kind of am him, you know? <laughs> it's like, maybe this is, what do they say in psychology? This is like, uh, uh, I forget, there's a name for this. That's like you, uh, when you really hate somebody, it's because you see yourself in them or something like that. I don't hate Camus, but I'm kind of exaggerating with that. But anyway, let's let's start on 41. I'm skipping quite a few quotes that I meant to cover, but since we're short on time, uh, let's move on. Um, he's just finished critiquing the approach of Kierkegaard and Husserl, and also Chestov, but we, we didn't really cover Chestov much, so I'm not gonna focus on that uh, too much. And really, we, it's not necessary. I think once we get his critique of either one of these, we kind of get his point. Um, he, has a, he has a sort of high regard for these thinkers and also Chestov. It's not that he thinks they're morons and that they're completely idiots. He actually, um, like I said, he has a high regard for them because he, he thinks that they do acknowledge this 
uh, phenomenon of the absurd, that they come face to face with it, that they realize that there's a, there can be a rift between the human and its world in these sort of thoughts of reflection. But the problem is that they all resolve it by, by um, eliminating one element of the divide, right? The uh, Hus Husserlian uh, phenomenology, the, his philosophy, his phenomenology, tends to sort of swallow up any individuality. The human individual is sort of lost in, in his descriptive philosophy that tries to get at the essence of certain experiences. And Camus is like, there is no essence to happiness, right? My happiness is gonna be a different experience than yours, right? So this essentializing is a sort of Platonism, as he puts it. This is almost like Plato with his ideal forms and it's, it's kind of, he's gonna say, a rejection of the individuality uh, in favor of just uh, analyzing and sort of picking apart the world in some scientific, uh, well, he thinks scientific, uh, I think scientists would beg to differ, but, a, but it's certainly a methodical way, a methodical way. The problem with Kierkegaard is he does the opposite. He eliminates the world in favor of the individual. Right? It's all about faith, and you can't understand Abraham. Only Abraham understands Abraham, and you're just like Abraham. You just got to figure it out. So when you figure it out, you'll know, but you won't be able to tell anybody because it's completely unique to you. So he, he, Camus wants us to maintain both elements of this rift and sort of, I guess, inhabit this space of absurdity. Um, and so here's on, on 41, let me read this. Uh, this is right after the three little asterisks there at the bottom of the page. Um, he, he gets back into this point about uh, philosophical suicide. I'm taking the liberty at this point of calling the existential attitude philosophical suicide, but that does not imply a judgment. It is a convenient way of indicating the movement by which a thought negates itself and tends to transcend itself in its very negation. For the existentials, negation is their God. Okay, this is another thing that's very hard to understand when you read existentialist philosophy, and I think he does a really bad job of explaining it here. I'm kind of thinking he's assuming you know a bit about Sartre already. Maybe you've read a little of existentialism before you pick this up, I guess is what. Otherwise, I think he's being a bit unfair, but this talk about negations and this thought about a thought negates itself and transcends itself in its very negation. Um, I've been talking about Sartre a lot in my other intro class, not my meaning of life class. So please feel free to interrupt and say, we already covered this. So I, I don't know how much we covered of Sartre. I know we covered a little bit, but for Sartre, negation is something that is very human to do. Um, when we say that something is for Sartre, when we say that something exists or is, what we're doing in that moment, so, and he's speaking like a phenomenologist. Remember Husserl, the phenomenologist? I'm just describing experience from the first person perspective. Um, well, Sartre says that when I experience that something is, when I have the experience that something is being or is something, the, the, what I'm experiencing is that it's distinct from other things. So for instance, when I recognize this object as my bottle of kombucha or whatever, for Sartre, um, the reason I'm able to do that is I'm able to isolate it from all other objects. So I know that it's not the desk that it was sitting on, it's not my hand, it's not the air that's around it. So anytime I see an object or a person or even myself, any being for Sartre, he's always known through this process of negation. I negate this so that I can sort of understand, you know, I isolate this object by negating all other things. And the human being does this. We are what he calls the origin of negation, Sartre says. We are the origin of negation. Another way that Sartre puts it is we are the nothingness at the center of existence. Uh, and the only reason that things have any being is because of this negation. Um, anybody ever go grocery shopping and make a list like a grocery list. Okay, so how do you make your grocery list? So before you go grocery shopping, what do you do to make your list? For. What are you looking for? What I don't have. What's not there? 
right? What lacks being there. Sartre, Sartre says, because we are the type of beings that at, at, at our heart are nothing, we're the only type of beings that are able to recognize a lack of being, that we're out of milk, we're out of eggs. Uh, when we go wait for our friend at the bar, they're supposed to be there at seven. We get to the bar, we look around, we notice their lack of being there. Someone walks in the door who looks like them and we look and, oh, it's, it's, it's my buddy Frank. Look at his hat, oh no, it's, it, it's not Frank, right? It just, he has the same hat that Frank has, right? So we, we recognize a lack of being. We are at sort of, at, at the heart of our, our essence, we are really nothing, right? When we try to isolate ourself, all we can really do is negate everything else. For Sartre, you know, our self, what is our, what's the self? It's not the desk, it's not the bottle, it's not you. It's nothing else. It's, for Sartre, it's not even my body. Because I have the experience of being in a body, of having a body. Um, so when I do this sort of process of negation, ultimately, for Sartre, um, I'm the one that's doing it. And it's something that I have to do, all humans do it. We have this emptiness that we're sort of born with that we have to fill up with meaning. Um, so when we do this, when we say that that's a desk, for instance, or this is a bottle, uh, Sartre claims that we are not just, it's not just some logical um, calculation in our mind. We're not like some computer, you know, if you watch the Terminator movies where the Terminator walks into the room and it you know, shows the camera angle from like the, the Terminator's eye view. So you're seeing the world like a robot and he's like measuring everybody, you know, you know, white Caucasian man, approximately 5'11", 200 pounds, you know, like, is he a threat or not? You know, he's like categorizing. That's not what we do, right? We, when, we, when we see a desk as a desk, when we see that our, we're out of eggs or whatever. Um, for Sartre, and I guess for Camus as well, for the existentialist, this has normative value. This has normative content. It's not just a logical operation of the mind. So what does that mean uh, to be normative? It expresses a norm. It expresses a standard. Um, one thing that Sartre talks about uh, that I don't see here in Camus is this notion of freedom. I, I don't know if Camus talks about revolt, uh, but I don't see the word freedom a lot in his writing. But Sartre talks about freedom, and he explains that we have an unlimited capacity for how we define things. We have this absolute freedom in that regard. But we don't always use this freedom, and there's good reasons for this. Again, back to my example. I could call this a zebra if I wanted to. I'm free to call it whatever I want. But no, I call it a desk. Why? Why do I call it a desk? Why don't I call it a zebra? I want to be unique and interesting. I'm going to call them zebras. Why, would, why wouldn't I do that? I guess I could if I just want to be a weirdo. But why would, why would somebody not do that? Why don't you do that? Why don't you come up with your own words for stuff? Just like... Like, no one would get you, right? You know, if you're like, hey man, I got a badass zebra last night. It, like, it's perfect. It's in my office. I was like doing homework on my zebra. It's very comfortable. It's like really well, it's all organized. I love my zebra. What are you talking about, right? So when we use language, when we speak, like we're sort of like playing, like Wittgenstein says, a language game, right? We're adhering to a norm, a standard of society. These things are called desks. These things are called zebras and, and, and therefore. So we're playing a game. So when we, we make these judgments, we may just think that they're just true, right? That's just a desk. But no, for him, these objects have no meaning in themselves. The meaning only comes from my project, what Sartre calls my project. Um, I engage in some project, and that gives all the objects around me significance. So for him, um, you know, the mountain has no meaning or value in itself. It just is. But the value of the mountain is always going to be predicated on what project I'm engaged in. He uses that word in a very broad sense. You might re replace the word in your mind with life project because you're probably thinking about like a group project or like some science project. No, but he's talking about like, I want to be a doctor. I want to be a lawyer. I want to, you know, be the next president or whatever it is. I have a goal. Um, and one way he describes that, when we do this, when we set goals for ourselves, we make ourselves into a lack of being. We make ourselves into a lack of being. So when I tell myself, I wanna become a doctor, then I'm like, I lack being that. I lack being a doctor. There's a hole that needs to be filled. 
right, with medical school and all this other stuff that you have to do to get certified to become a doctor. I mean, I lack being a lot of things. I lack being a garbage man. I lack being a computer programmer. But for some reason, that one thing I notice and I want to fill it, right? And so for him, once I get engaged in a project that gives all my, my world has meaning. All the objects in my world have significance. And that's why I guess when, 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 when shit falls apart and my project fails, that's when I feel the absurd. That's when the world, the objects no longer have any meaning or significance. Uh, they're still there, and I'm like, yeah, people call that a desk, but I'm not gonna use it. I don't wanna write anymore, I don't even wanna do anything. Um, but back to the mountain, right? The mountain has no meaning in itself. The meaning comes from the project that I'm engaged in. If I'm on vacation in Switzerland, in the Alps, and I, you know, I'm just there enjoying the view, right? I, I'm hiking and I see the mountains and I'm like, wow, look at the sun and the light, it's beautiful. So I take out my phone and I take pictures. So the mountain appears as something to be admired, to be photographed, to be posted on my Instagram, to brag on my friend, whatever. Um, if I was a mountain climber, then I might see it differently. Right? I mean, I'd be like, well, I, I would still maybe notice it's beautiful, but I'd be also thinking about, is it something that's worth my, my time, right? Maybe, or maybe it's too hard for me. I gotta work my way up. You know, I'm thinking, is this a mountain that I could climb? How much gear would I have to bring? Um, if my project involves getting on the other side of the mountain for some reason, now it's an obstacle. If I'm a farmer who lives at the base of the mountain, I might not even notice it, I take it for granted. Maybe I noticed it when I built my farm and I thought it was a good place, just the right amount of sunlight or whatever. But the, the point is that same object, that same thing, the mountain, takes on a new value and a new meaning to each individual who engages with it. And the meaning is determined by that project. And the project is based on some negation, right? Me saying, I'm not yet this. I'm not, I wanna become this. And that's a good thing. We want, we want, it sounds negative, making yourself a lack of being. That sounds like being nothing, right? But what he really means is seeing that you lack accomplishments that you want to have, just like your refrigerator lacks eggs that you want to have or whatever. You're making a grocery list for yourself, basically. What am I missing and what needs to be filled? Um, but for Sartre, and this, I guess, is, this is where, and I guess there's a bit of an overlap here we have a tendency to engage with bad faith. We don't really want to accept the responsibility that our freedom places on our shoulders. So we often will sort of, what we'll do is we'll engage in, again, he calls it bad faith. We'll tell a lie to ourselves. We'll construct a sort of image of ourselves and we'll sort of play this role and usually try to fit some mold that we think uh, is correct. And for him, this is uh, to be avoided if we're going to be honest about our, our, our freedom. To give a good example of this uh, to sort of illustrate the point. Well, he, there's a funny saying. He once, he once said um, that we want to be an inkwell the way that an inkwell is an inkwell. And I don't know. Most people don't even know what an inkwell is anymore. So I don't know if that's the pet. Who, does anybody know what an inkwell is? Yeah. She just pantomimed it. Y'all know it, right? So that's, I like that you just did it with your with the hand gesture. You didn't even have to say anything. You just did the hand gesture. Yeah. So you know, you used to have pens that didn't have ink in them. You had to have a little ink well on your desk, a little jar with ink, and you dip your pen in, like she did with her hand there. Um, so even if you didn't know what it is, now you do know what it is, okay? And you know what its its purpose is, okay? What does an ink well have to do to fulfill its purpose? What's that? Right. Well, but what does it have to, does it have to do anything? It has to have ink, has to have ink in it, but is that its responsibility? No. no, it just has to be an inkwell. It just has to be. So when he says that we want to be an inkwell, like we don't know what wants to be an inkwell, that sounds boring, but we want to be like that. We want to be just easily defined. It's obvious what you're there for. You're there to be dipped in or whatever. And what do you have to do to fulfill your responsibility? Oh, just be. Right? So we're kind of lazy, but we want to pretend we're not. We're like, I'm a badass. I fulfill this function without even trying, you know, <laughs> kind of thing. You know, but he's like, that's, that's sort of bad faith. It's hard to face up to all this, right? Um, so all this talk about negation and when Camus says, uh, um, 
the, a thought negates itself and tends to transcend itself in its very negation. I think he's talking about what Sartre calls about making yourself a lack of being. When you make yourself a lack of being, when you say, I lack being a doctor, do you wanna become a doctor? I lack being a nurse, I wanna become a nurse, or whatever your career path, or I wanna become, I wanna get married and have a family, right? You're, you're telling yourself, I lack being this and I want to be this. It's a negation, but it transcends itself because it goes beyond itself. Once I decide that this isn't a part of my life, I want it to be a part of my life. This is another phrase you hear a lot from the existentialists, they'll say, the, the, the free individual transcends the given. In fact, Sartre talks about us as a transcendence. You're a transcendence, you're, we are, I'm a transcendence. Why are we a transcendence? Well, we're thrown in the world and we didn't really control that. We're just thrown, Heidegger uses that word a lot. You're thrown, there's this thrownness about your, your, your very existence. And you can't control that. You didn't decide to be thrown here, but here you are. But once you're here, Sartre, and I suppose Camus is, 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 is asserting this as well. Once you're here, you, you transcend the given through, your, through engaging in projects, to use Sartre's term. You know, here, I've given all this material. I, I live in a world where there's all these different roles to play. I could be a criminal. I could be a doctor. I could be a politician. There's all these possibilities. How am I going to engage in that? And when I decide, make that decision, he describes it as transcending. I transcend the given. I go beyond the given. Um, so this is the existential philosophy. On the top of page 42, he writes, uh, like suicides, gods change with men. There are many ways of leaping, the essential being to leap. Uh, those redeeming negations, those ultimate contradictions which negate the obstacle that has not yet been leaped over may spring just as well uh, from a certain religious inspiration as from the rational order. They always lay claim to the eternal and it is solely in this that they take the lead. Okay, and this, is, I don't think, this is, he doesn't like this part, okay? So when we're faced with the question of our existence and how we're gonna engage, um, you know, Sartre says we engage in these projects. Well, that's all fine and good, and in a way that takes a leap, but Camus is warning us against a leap into the eternal, these leaps that lay claim to the eternal. In a way, I think there's a relationship between this notion of the eternal and what he also calls nostalgia earlier in the essay. Who remembers, what was nostalgia? How was, what was that defined as? I think we covered that last time. Well, it's a, it's a, a need for something. What, what were you gonna? It was like something that we knew that it couldn't live around anymore. Well, that's what it means commonly. Oh. That's what nostalgia means. Like if somebody says they're being nostalgic, they're, they're pining over the past or whatever. But he uses it in a very peculiar way. He talks about it's like a, a, an urge for unity, to unify. So we take all like the elements of our lives and we, we tell ourselves a story, right? How it all fits together. But he's sort of, his point is that it doesn't fit together. The world is chaos, right? And when you do that, you're, you're sort of, um, this is where I, I think people misread him. He's not, he's not in favor of being irrational, right? That's one way people read this essay, especially the critics of him. Um, you know, I criticize him for other reasons, but they, they'll criticize him for being an irrationalist. He's irrational, you know, this idea of embracing the absurd. What are you saying, just be absurd and be a dumbass, like be crazy and just do weird stuff? But no, that's not what he means by the absurd. Uh, and two, he even says it, I, I'm not gonna try to find the passage, but he says something like, when we, when we, when we find that there's a limit to reason, that, that reason can only go so far, that doesn't mean we reject it. You know, it just means that you can't rely on it completely. So, you know, the, 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 the problem with Husserl is he relies on reason 100%. He thinks, well, I, I've got this rift between the human being and the world. Uh, forget the rift. Let's just examine the world. Let's just analyze it. Um, and he's, he's being hyper-rational, trying to sort of, I'm not going to make any assertions that I can't back up with reason. And this, th this ends up, you end up in a sort of, you hit a wall, almost like a, Rumsford from the Sirens of Titan jumping into the chronosynclastic infundibulum, right? That reason can only take you so far. Can reason explain the differences between your love of 
I don't know, a family member versus your love of a pizza, right? I was actually talking about this last, uh, yesterday when we were talking about uh, utilitarianism and John Stuart Mill, right? The utilitarians, they think that all, all ethics are based on pleasure and pain and that you can somehow measure those things, you know, maybe that, you know, that something's good if it produces pleasure and it's bad if it produces pain. Well, sometimes my mom annoys me. Pizza never annoys me. But if I had to choose between the two, I'd stick with mom. Right? So it's like, the, you know, there's things that, you know, obviously I love them both, but certainly I love mom more. Can I measure that? Can I put a, put that in a calculator? I don't think so. I think that's impossible. So there's a limit to reason, but that doesn't mean we just are irrational like Kierkegaard. Kierkegaard's like, oh, we'll just be crazy and think about stupid stuff and don't worry about explaining it to people if it's in your heart. You know, I remember uh, when I went to go see Joel Osteen, he was quoting this passage from um, Revelations, I think. Uh, and he was talking about, um, what did it say? Uh, I'll probably mess up the quote from the Bible, but it was something like, only, or sorry, don't let them take the crown off your head, right? Only you can take the crown off your own head or something. And if you actually read that in context, I don't really think Osteen got it right, but he used it anyway. So whatever, it was a cool, it was a cool, like I'm not religious, but it was like, it was kind of a fun, I guess as far as like inspirational speeches go, it was okay, but the point he was making was like, you are the one that lowers your own self-estimation kind of thing, you know? And he gave an example of this kid who um, tried out for the baseball team and didn't make it, right? And so, um, you know, Joel Osteen's like, you know, and, and he really was gonna be a good player, but the coach was like, sorry, you're just not good enough for the team. But the coach didn't see that light that was in his heart. Only he knew that light. You know, his father knew that he had that light. And so his father went and he started his own team and, and all these other kids that didn't make the baseball team. And he recruited all these other kids that didn't make the cut. And then they got together, they started, and they won. They beat that other team, you know? And he's like all like excited about all this stuff, you know? Um, but yeah, like, I don't know how that gets talking about Joel Osteen. Now I'm like completely off topic. But anyway, so so this, this idea that, um, I know, that's where I was getting it from. The f I know what's in my heart. I know I'm gonna be a good baseball player, even though I tried out and I sucked and I couldn't hit one ball, I couldn't pitch to save my life. But no, I know in my heart. Like that, that's the Kierkegaard approach, right? That's the Kierkegaard approach, right? To be fair to Kierkegaard, he says that, that, that despair can be like that too. Like you can be mistaken about that. We'll be talking about the despair of, uh, of uh, infinitude. Uh, or the despair of defiance, where you're like, I'm gonna be an actor, even though you suck at acting, or, you know, it's like, so to be fair, Kierkegaard is a little more subtlety than that, but that's, I guess, the basic criticism uh, that Camus is, is leveling. This guy takes it to the extreme of rejecting rationality straight up. Well, rationality has limits, so let's just do away with it. And Husserl's like, well, I can't find value in the world, and I can't make sense of value, so let's just quantify things and describe them and try to get at the structures of them, right? And, and, and both of those approaches are deficient. They, all, they both try to avoid embracing the absurd condition of our existence. And this is what the existentialists like Camus or, or uh, uh, Sartre want us to do. Um, let me skip quite a bit here, right? I think we've already made the point. Um, yeah, more on rationality. Well, actually, let me do read this. This is on page 48. Uh, he's talking about reason uh, again. In this is at the bottom, the last paragraph there. He says, just as reason was able to soothe the melancholy of Plotinus, it provides modern anguish the means of calming itself in the familiar setting of the eternal. Oh, yeah, we never answered that question. What, is, what do you think he means by the eternal? There's a similarity, I don't say the same thing. Like again, nostalgia is this notion for unification, for unifying. If something's eternal, what does that mean? Lasting. Always existing, lasting forever. So when Sartre talks about engaging in a project, he almost, this is where his critics come in and I think that they're too hard on him and they're not fair, but it's, he's not really good at expressing it. So I guess, you know, he says that when we engage in a project, we're always gonna fail, like always, 
right? You're never gonna, you know, whenever you decide I'm gonna do this thing, you have this sort of vision in your head of how it's gonna work out. Does it ever work that way? Right, only two guys in here. Guys, you know, sometimes you're on a date, you ever take a girl on a date and you're like planning ahead, right? Like first I'll take her here, have a couple drinks, appetizers, whatever. We'll go to this other spot, they have music. You, know, you got like this whole thing and you're kind of imagining like what's gonna go on that night, how it's gonna, and then what happens when you, does it all, does it ever? No, it never does. You know, sometimes like maybe you haven't seen your friend in a while. Like, right. oh man, my friend's coming to visit. And you're thinking of all the stuff you're gonna do and how you're gonna interact with each other. And maybe you haven't seen each other in so long, there's just, they're different people and you don't exactly interact and, and the, the way that you thought. So there's this notion, you know, this idea that, you know, our existence is not that predictable. So no matter what I engage in, no matter what project I engage in, it's never gonna be 100% successful. And even if it is too, is that the end? Like, let's say I'm gonna say, okay, I wanna become the greatest writer that American literature has ever had. So I'm gonna quit teaching, I'm gonna write novels, and just sit down and write fiction for the rest of my life. So I devote my life to this. And then I do it, I win like a, let's say I win the Pulitzer Prize for, or Nobel Prize for literature. Um, what am I gonna, am I gonna be an inkwell from that point on? Am I just gonna sit there and, you know, okay, now I'm done. Just sit here and tell me how, I'm gonna sit here and y'all gonna tell me how great I am, what a great writer I am. Is that what I'll do? Is that, yeah, you're like, well, maybe. Isn't that what J.D. Salinger kind of did? The Catcher in the Rye guy? He got famous and then just like disappeared for the rest of his life, you know? Nobody saw him for like 40 years till he, he died and they're like, yeah, I, guess. I think he's overrated by the way. <laughs> I think the only reason he's so highly rated is because he did that. I think maybe like his PR guy was like, your books are okay, but they're not that great. Maybe if you like disappeared and never wrote ever again, then like, I don't know. I know like people watching this on YouTube might, some literature majors might be like, Scott, Jay Salinger, how dare you? You know, he's the greatest writer, you know, catcher the rye. You know? uh, <laughs> I think he's overrated. I, think he's like, I like that book when I was a teenager, but like, it's a good book for a teenager. I don't think, like, compared to some other novels. But, you know, we have this idea that we're going to just like, we got these, these, these checklists, you know, get degree, get married, get house, have kids. One dog, one cow, and whatever, right? Yeah, and, and then we'll just be, right? We'll just sit there and just enjoy life, right? That never happens, right? There's always new things to worry about. We finish one project, we complete it, and then, then there's another one. Sometimes we never complete that project. I mean, how many times did I change my freaking major, man? I was gonna be a, I was gonna be a, I was gonna be an audio engineer when I first went to college. Right. I was. Then I got into video editing, and then I got into sound design, uh, and and then I transferred to this program that was so competitive. And they wanted me to learn like music theory for a couple of years, and I was like, this is too much. So I'm just going to teach philosophy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I was like, I, my my fallback plan was English because I was like, I always liked to read, and I just I always got straight A's in English without even trying. Like I just really good at I guess reading and explaining and stuff. So. I was like, that, that was my backup plan. But then I took a class in philosophy as part of my like requirement. And, and I was like, no, this is, this is what I want to do. But you know, and, and, and then this changes, you know, like you roll with the punches, that's how life is. So I think, you know, when you talk about the eternal, this is, this is, I don't know, kind of in a way, maybe it's akin to Sartre's bad faith. We engage in a project, but we're not honest about that, right? We, we act like it's some eternal value that we are adhering to um, instead of like, no, this is what I decided matters. This is how I'm gonna live my life. We sort of act like, no, it's just the right thing to do, period. Um, Simone de Beauvoir, she uses a great metaphor for this. She's another existentialist. She said, it's like someone who writes a love letter to themselves and forgets that they're the ones who wrote the letter. Right, so I'm just picturing this poor, lonely old cat woman or something, you know, having too many scotches one night, and I wish the, I wish some handsome man would write me a romantic letter. You know, she like gets drunk and writes some, you know, syrupy letter to herself, and then she's all blackout drunk, so she doesn't even remember. She drops it under her couch, and one day she's like vacuuming and cleaning, and what is this? And pulls the, oh, someone loves me, you know, like that. that that's. That's, that's, that's what we do to ourselves. Uh, 
the existentialists will argue, right? We, we decide, you know, I'm a Christian or Muslim or I'm not religious or I'm a Democrat or Republican. And then instead of like engaging with every confrontation anew and trying to think through it, honestly, we just follow a script, right? We're just like, uh, I was talking about this earlier today with my, my intro class where we were going over SART. Uh, when I was in high school, you know, I you know, remember we had little cliques that people would be in. And in my high school, it was there was just really three main, all the jocks and the preppies kind of hung out. And then there were what we called them the kickers, right? They were like all the cowboys and, you know, pickup truck driving. And there was a big agriculture department in my high school. And then there was my group who were just collectively known as the freaks, uh, you know, the punk rockers and the goth kids. And we, we actually owned that. We like, I'm a freak, you know, we, like, we owned that title. But some people, they, they, they thought it was derogatory. The people that weren't freaks would call us that and they think that we didn't like it, but we, we actually kind of got off on it, you know? Um, but that's what my point is too, is as, as, as rebellious as we thought we were, the freaks, you know, I, I guess we were a little bit more unique. You know, we had a little bit more unique, but you know, we had rules. Like I remember some of the dumb stuff that I would hear, like I remember if you were wearing Doc Martens, you could, I forgot, what is it? There's 12 holes and then there's 16, I forgot. But if, if you have 12 holes, you're a racist skinhead. No, no, I think the, the, more, the more holes, the, one, the longer ones, that's skinhead. The shorter ones are skater, right? So if you're a skater, if you have like 12 hole Doc Martens, if you have 18 hole, then you're a racist skinhead, right? And, and if you have red suspenders, you're a racist skinhead. If you have white suspenders, you're a non-racist skinhead. And it was like, okay, like I decided that I'm gonna reject all this, like trying to fit in with people. And now you want me to fit into another mold, you know? And I kind of did, right, to be fair. Like I think I was better than some of my friends because some of them, like they, they would give me crap if I listen to any music besides the most aggressive angry punk rock you know if it wasn't like dead Kennedys or black flag or you know something like that minor threat they're like what is this weird noise jazz music you're listening to and I was like I'm like I'm sorry man my parents are hippies <laughs> like I just you know it's, it's hereditary um but yeah, so we, you know, I hate, you know, the word eternal has religious connotations. Um, so I think it's kind of misleading. And maybe that is a much more prominent form of what he's talking about when people have this idea that, oh, I've kind of figured out what I value. And instead of saying, I figured out what I value, like, well, this is just what's valuable, right? I, I like the way she puts it, that people that engage in their, with their existence like this, they don't put, uh, or they don't uh, recognize uh, the, the, that the word useful, it doesn't really have an absolute meaning. So when somebody engages in a project and they forget that they're the ones that decided that that's what they wanted to do, they start treating it as some eternal values that they're sort of manifesting. They start to see anything that's useful for them is just useful, period, right? They become dogmatic about it. But for her, uh, I guess Sartre would agree with her, useful doesn't really mean anything by itself. The word useful requires a compliment. If I say that something's useful, well, useful for what purpose? Useful for who? It's like the word left or right or up or down. They have no meaning by themselves. You know, if I ask you, or sorry, if you ask somebody, how do you get to Austin from here? And they say, oh, just take a left and then go drive for a while and then take a right, and then drive for a while, like a, a long time, and, and then you'll be tossed. <laughs> and you're like, what? Like, take a left where, and take a right where? Like, what street? Same thing with useful, right? And people who, uh, she calls it seriousness, right? The serious man, right? They're the ones who construct this, they, they write this love letter to themselves, and they forget they wrote the letter. Um, and this is dangerous, right? For her, for political reasons, she says. You know, these are the type that, uh, she talks, she talks about the, uh, the colonial administrator who thinks that the highway is useful. I know, you know in Europe when they were building the highway system, it wasn't quite like in America where we had a bunch of wide open spaces. And um, the, the, the automobile kind of, you know, it started to become a thing. We still hadn't really fully industrialized. So it was a lot easier for us to build the highway system in Europe 
building the highway system. Has anybody been to Europe and driven through Europe? It sucks. <laughs> it sucks. Super narrow. Super narrow streets. And like, so like you go through France and you're like driving up these cliffs and you're like, oh my goodness. And like they don't have automatic transmission. It's all like manual transmission. It's it's a bitch to drive in Europe. Especially if you're American, you're used to like these big wide roads and driving a big car and all this stuff. So when she, she talks about, you know, the colonial administrator who has to build their highway, I'm picturing this guy who's like on the city council who's like, I've got to build this highway and we're going to, we're going to basically use them in a domain to steal your property, even though, you know, maybe there's this wine vineyard that's been in the family for generations and this tradition or whatever. So people like this, they tend to, they get wrapped up in whatever their form of the useful is, um, whatever, you know, they see as eternally valid to use his language and they kind of shut off all other possibilities. Right. That's another thing I think that's bad about this. It's not just dangerous for other people because uh, they want to impose their ideas on everyone else, like oh, some sort of dictator, but it's really kind of dangerous uh, for them. Um, in fact, and maybe this is the good point that I think he makes in his essay, and you know, I keep giving him crap, so let me be nice to him. Um, what's going to happen if you put all your eggs in one basket and you put all meaning into one possibility? For instance, she mentions, like, what if you're the military man? For you, the military is useful and everything is based on that. So you might know someone like this. I know I've met people like this, like their family, they're all military family. Their mom, their dad are military. All their brothers and sisters are military. They're like, I, when I turn 18, I'm gonna go and enlist and all this stuff. Well, that's great. And they might get a lot of, out of life with that. And that's fine. But what happens when they fail and they can't get to the military? I actually knew a guy like this. Well, I didn't really know him that well. He was my friend's brother. And uh, my buddy, he, uh, his brother, they, they were raised by separate uh, parents, so they didn't really know each other that well. And his brother was raised by his dad, and his dad was, I mean, I don't want to diss him, but it sounds like he wasn't that good of a dad. He, he was very into his work. He was very good at cars, like he repaired race cars, Italian, like these really fancy cars. And he kind of neglected his son, and people would give him shit for it, but he would always say, well, He's gonna join the military when he turns 18. That will make him a man, right? They'll teach him all he needs to know about life. I don't need to teach him all this stuff. People are like, why don't you teach him how to fix cars? Why don't you teach him like some of your skills? And he's like, ah, oh, he'll learn all he needs. I went to the military and that's how I learned this. He'll, he'll do the same. He'll just, just like I did, I went to the military, it worked for me, this will work for him, right? Work for me, it works for everybody else, eternally true, always true, always valid, it's gonna work. You know what happened? He went to go enlist when he turned 18. You gotta ask my kid, you can't serve in the military. What can I do? Desk up. You get really badass one. You got also got a hernia. You, you can't do it. You, you ne never, ever. You can never, ever serve in the armed forces. Period. How do you think that set with him? It devastated him, right? I, he still, I think, is scarred because of that, right? So you know, this is this is what leads to sort of this nihilistic attitude, right? This sort of a c confrontation with the absurd. Right? My whole world is alienated from me. I thought it was all about serving your country and being a, a soldier and defending your nation and patriot. And now I can't do that. And I'll never be able to do that. And then we tend to sort of reject existence. So I guess for Camus, his advice is to avoid that altogether by avoiding this. Right? No hope, right? Uh, just enjoy life. Get as much out of it as you can but don't cry over something that just didn't work out your way because that's just the way life is. It's hard and shitty stuff happens and you can't predict it, right? So be tough, right? And to me, that's like, again, I think I kind of follow that advice, but I don't think that's the best advice for some people. Need, they need their story. They need their belief in the you know, eternal and whatnot. So anyway, um, yeah. I, I, he puts it here, uh, he says that, I'll finish, this is where I left off, he says, uh, the absurd mind has less luck, right? It doesn't latch on to the eternal. It doesn't latch on to hope. For it, the world is neither so rational nor so irrational, right? So he's neither a Kierkegaard or a Husserl. Um, it is unreasonable and only that. Right? It's not irrational or rational, it's just unreasonable, right? It doesn't listen to your demands, right? This kind of reminds me of uh, Vonnegut with his God of the Utterly Indifferent. 
Uh, the absurd, on the contrary, establishes its limits since it is powerless to calm its anguish. Kierkegaard independently asserts that a single limit is enough to negate that anguish, but the absurd does not go so far. Right? So again, so Kierkegaard, again, he looks for the eternal. Gotta find my Abraham, or not my Abraham, gotta find my Isaac. I gotta find my, my one thing that's gonna give me absolute meaning. But for him, this is the last line of that paragraph, the absurd is lucid reason noting its limits. That word lucid again, what does lucid mean? Lucid reasoning, noting its limits. Lucid, clear, right? clearly known, right? So we're not, we're not lying to ourselves, right? We're not telling ourselves a fiction. We're embracing the absurd. Um, Now let's go to the next section here. This is the uh, one on absurd freedom. I want to at least read a few lines from this before we finish up today. How are we doing? We're doing pretty good on time. All right. Um, let's just start with the opening line here. Now the main thing is done. I hold certain facts from which I cannot separate. What I know, what is certain, what I cannot deny, what I cannot reject. And this is what counts. I cannot negate everything of that part of me that lives on vague nostalgias except this desire for unity, this longing to solve, this need for clarity and cohesion. I can refute everything in this world surrounding me that offends or enraptures me except this chaos, this sovereign chance, and this divine equivalence which springs from anarchy. I don't know whether this world has a meaning that transcends it, but I know that I do not know them, that meaning, and that it's impossible for, for me just to just now to know it. Um, so again, I you know he's kind of recapitulating a point he's just been driving home this whole essay. Um, at this point, he's gotten the, he, he, he's gotten the realization where he's like, well, look, I know that this is not going to work. I don't want it. I don't want to. Uh, give up yet, right? I don't want to just say, okay, well then suicide is justified. Um, but how am I gonna sort of maintain myself in my existence? Well, I've gotta do it in such a way um, that I, I, I'm not lying to myself. So I have to acknowledge though, even though nostalgia is kind of bullshit, and that when we do this, when we unify everything, it's kind of the story we tell ourselves, but I can't lie to myself about my desire for that. It's gonna be there. Like there's a human need, as Sartre puts it, that there's this emptiness at the heart of existence. Being an existing human being means that there's something to do, right? We want to fill in that need, we wanna fill in that hole. That yearning for unity, that yearning for nostalgia, it's not gonna go away, so what do I do with it? Right? If, we, if we're not going to do this, and hopefully not do that, uh, what to do? Well, what can a meaning outside my condition mean to me? I can understand only in human terms. So this is another reason I guess he's going to reject what we call the eternal, some notion of spirituality. That's something outside of me. He wants to deal with what I can actually experience directly, something concrete. In a way, I think he's kind of on board with Husserl to a certain extent here, right? Husserl is like, well, if it's something that's like metaphysical, I can't see it, I can't touch it, I can't feel it, I can't experience it, it might be there, but what use is it for me? I gotta deal with what I can see, what I can feel, what the content that I've got to work with. Did you have a question? I thought you um, So I can only understand it in human terms. What I touch, what resists me, that is what I understand. And these two certainties, my appetite for the absolute and for unity and the impossibility of reducing the world to a rational and reasonable principle. I also know that I cannot reconcile them. This reminds me a bit of uh, a line from Kant. Uh, he says at the beginning of the critique of pure reason, he said something like, human reason is um, designed in such a way, or I hate to say designed, he would never have said that. He, would, he said, there is something inherent about human reason such that given its nature, given the way that human reason is, it can't help but ask certain questions. And given its nature, it could never answer those questions. And he, what he has in mind are questions about, does God exist? Is there life after death? Uh, do we have free will or are our actions determined by other causes? Kant thinks these are questions that, given the nature of human intellect, 
we are inevitably going to ask them. We, we want to know the answer. We're curious. But given our intellect, we don't have the skills. To, we don't have the ability to know it. We can't go beyond our own experience. So we're sort of, this is a kind of a tragic situation. We really want an answer to a question that we could never know the answer to. All right? So how do we do, how do we deal with this? Um, what other truth can I admit without lying, without bringing in a hope that I lack and which means nothing within the limits of my condition? Um, and so this is where we get to this, this ethics of quantity that I mentioned, I guess a couple lectures back. I don't know if he actually uses the phrase here, ethics of quantity. I think it might be a little bit later on in the essay, but here's where we first start to get a glimpse of Camus' ethics of quantity, right? Well, what do I do then, right? Now I'm stuck with my existence. I've got to exist. <laughs> Otherwise, I have to do myself in, but I can't hope. So what do I do? Well, I make the most of it, right? Um, on page 53, at the bottom of that section, he says, it's with, it, sorry, it is with this that he's concerned. He wants to find out if it is possible to live without appeal, all right? So the absurd man, what, what, what Camus calls the absurd man, lives without appeal. They're not appealing to hope. They're not, they're not appealing to some preconceived notion of the et like eternal values or anything like that. So what is this going to look like? He says, well, and now we come back kind of full swing to the beginning of the essay. He says, now I can broach the notion of suicide. It's already been felt what solution might be given. At this point, the problem is reversed. It was pre previously a question of finding out whether or not life had to have a meaning to be lived. It now becomes clear on the contrary that it will be lived all the better if it has no meaning. Right, so he thinks you're going to get more out of it if, if, if you stop trying to make everything make sense, this sort of yearning for nostalgia. If you start, stop trying to look for some eternal values that you can always turn to, some rule book that's always going to set you on the right path. you got to give up on that, he says. You've got to live without appeal to these things. Um, you're going to live better that way, he says. Living an experience, a particular fate, is accepting it fully. Now, no one will live this fate, knowing it to be absurd, unless he does everything to keep before him that, that absurd brought to light by consciousness. Negating one of the terms, right, the, the world or the self, negating one of the terms uh, of the opposition on which he lives amounts to escaping it. To abolish conscious revolt is to elude the problem. Uh, so yeah, he kind of, this is interesting, um, Camus wrote, actually wrote an essay after this called The Rebel, and it's, a, it's, a, it's an essay on revolt, and revolt is also, I guess, a minor theme of this essay as well, revolt on the individual level. He sees this absurd stance, this sort of, you know, keeping both terms together but also separate, right, standing in that absurd sort of spot. He calls this a form of revolt, right? They were sort of revolting. We're like, okay, I'm gonna accept my, the absurd fate that I have, but I'm not gonna fall for this trick. I'm not gonna fall for that trick, but I'm gonna do something with myself. I'm gonna make the most of my existence. Let's see, oh, sorry, I skipped way ahead. Uh, let me back up a bit. So the theme of permanent revolution is thus carried into individual experience. Living is keeping the absurd alive. Keeping it alive, above all, contemplating it. Unlike Eurydice, the absurd dies only when we turn away from it. One of the only coherent philosophical positions is thus revolt. It is a constant confrontation between man and his own obscurity. It is an insistence upon an impossible transparency. It challenges the world anew every second. Yeah, this is another thing about the essay that I, I just, I find problematic. I, I don't, I'm not quite sure what he's describing here. I mean, even earlier, my, my sort of confession to you guys, that I kind of guess I do live like he, he says, but even as I'm speaking now, I, I'm not thinking about, things are meaningful for me, right? Like this lecture, you're paying attention or not paying attention. Like I'm concerned with that. When I see people nodding off and not being like, it bothers me. So like, obviously, like I'm not 24 seven telling myself it really doesn't matter. It doesn't really matter. It only matters because I decided to make it matter. Like, but that's ridiculous, right? Once you engage in the world, like you're gonna like, I don't know, maybe when we get to the next chapter, which we're not really gonna cover in depth, and he talks about the actor, 
he can sort of respond to this a bit, right? We were talking about method acting or something like that. So maybe, maybe I'm being, I'm misreading him a bit. You know, maybe he's saying that, well, obviously you're not constantly thinking like some sulky nihilist, but you're prepared, I guess, for failure, right? When things go wrong, you're not gonna like let it just blow you away because you know, hey, things didn't work out. I'm kind of depressed right now, but I'll get over it and life will present me with other opportunities or something like this, I, I guess. I'm trying to help him out here. Um, just as danger provided man the unique opportunity of seizing awareness, so metaphysical revolt extends awareness to the whole of experience. It is that constant presence of man in his own eyes. It is not aspiration, for it is devoid of hope. That revolt is the certainty of a crushing fate without the resignation that ought to accompany it. So it's sort of like I resign myself to the fact that everything is sort of hopeless, but at the same time, I don't know, I, I have this, this uh, passion? I don't know, to me this seems contradictory, this seems paradoxical. Um, you know, he says that this is, this is how you're going to seize the day. This is how you're going to carpe diem. I suppose the sentiment that he's got in mind here is, uh, you may have heard someone say something like this. You know, you only live once. You know, you, you've only got so much time. You've got to make the most of it, right? Don't waste time. I guess that's kind of the sentiment that he's expressing here, uh, in what he's trying to say. Uh, but it seems like being fully engaged and passionate about something contradicts that feeling of absurdity. If you engage in something passionately, like maybe if somebody called you out and said, you know, it doesn't really matter. I'd be like, yeah, but shut up. I'm having fun, you know, like, but they would have to call you out. Like this, this notion of absurdity, I don't think it's something you could maintain permanently. But anyway, that's just sort of my critique. Uh, but he says, this is where it is seen to what degree of absurd experience is remote from suicide. It may be thought that suicide follows revolt, but wrongly. It does not represent the logical outcome of revolt. It is just the contrary by the consent it presupposes. Suicide, like the, the leap, is, an, is acceptance at its extreme. Everything is over and man returns to his essential history, his future, his unique and dreadful future. He sees and rushes towards it. In its way, suicide settles the absurd. It engulfs the absurd in the same death. So this is, a this is a way of trying to resolve the absurd. So he says, no, let's embrace it. Maybe this is the, a good point to bring up the myth of Sisyphus. Um, maybe some of you are already familiar with the myth before you even took the course. Uh, is anybody uh, familiar with the myth of Sisyphus? It's referred to in the title. Or if you read the last section of the book, you got that far. Um, he tells us the story. What's the story of Sisyphus? What happened to old Sisyphus? He was punished by the gods, right? Pushing that rock. Yeah. Well, so he, 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 he cheated death by tricking the gods several times, right? Uh, I forget the whole story. In fact, there's a really good YouTube video that someone did with animation that I should probably, I'll try to find that, maybe play it at the beginning of class uh, next time, because it tells you the whole story. It's kind of clever, right? He was very clever. He you know, told, what did he tell? Oh, he, I think he told Zeus that he was mad at his wife, so he just wanted to talk to her like on that, the funeral, and then he never came back or something like that. But eventually the gods get him, they catch him, they are freaking mad, because he tricked him like four or five times. He cheated death so many times, but they punish him uh, by making him push a rock up a hill for eternity. So he keeps pushing the rock up, pushing the rock up, and then it falls down to the bottom, and then he's gotta go back down, push the rock up again. And, and this is always seen as tragic, but Camus seems to think of it as a beautiful uh, allegory, and that this is actually, the, this is what the absurd man is, right? He doesn't kill himself, uh, right? He keeps living. He keeps, even though he knows it's absurd, that he's gonna go back down there, he's gonna push that boulder, the boulder represents the world, right? He's gonna have that world on his shoulder, he's gonna engage in it, and then he'll fail again. Uh, but he'll be fine with that, he'll be happy, even though he knows it's absurd, right? So in a way, um, and we'll talk more about this next time we get to that section, um, maybe this saves him against my critique. He's just not expressing himself very well in this passage. 
uh, because when he's talking about um, Sisyphus, he seems to think that when Sisyphus is pull, pushing the boulder up the hill, that his mind is just on the boulder. Right, so I guess when you're engaged in a, like for Sark project, to use his language, you're engaged in the world, right? Like you don't, you're not really in this absurd state where you're like alienated from it. It's only after the boulder falls down that Sisyphus is walking down the mountain. That's when the absurd happens, right? That's when there's the, this alienation from the human being and the world. And it's sort of like they're walking down the mountain. And the typical reading of that story is that's depressing as hell. Like when Sisyphus gets to the top of the mountain and the boulder falls down, he's like, oh God, this sucks. I gotta go back down and get that heavy thing again. But Camus says, no, that's when he's the most happy, right? Is that, he, that, that's when he's embracing the absurd and he's like, cool, round two or three or four or five or six or 108 million or whatever the hell. He just keeps coming back for more, bring me more, right? Sort of ethics of quantity lie to the gods to keep living and living, right? Even though it's absurd, I wanna see what else it has to offer. I wanna see what else. I wanna get as much out of this as possible, right? And I don't think, and again, I don't think we're gonna have time to get into the details of this. I don't think he's saying that like, you should try every hobby that ever existed, you know? There might be stuff you're not really that into, you know? But like, let's find out, right? Man, I, maybe this is another reason I think I kind of do follow his advice because I get really into stuff for like four or five years and I move on to something else. I'm really bad like that, you know? Like I did Kung Fu for like four or five years and I got into barbell training and then I started teaching Pilates. And like, like, it's like, dude, like settle down. You know, then I do my music, I do my video editing and it's just like, I need to like narrow it down to like one or two hobbies instead of, you know, but I think Kamu be like, no, this is great. That's what you're supposed to do. You, that's, that's right. You know, maybe you should get more out of one before you move on to the next, but that sort of is, seems to be kind of his advice for life here. Um, but I know that in order to keep alive, the absurd cannot be settled. It escapes, it escapes suicide to the extent that it is, it is simultaneously awareness and rejection of death. It is at the extreme limit of the condemned man's last thought, that shoelace that despite everything he sees a few yards away on the very brink of his dizzying fall, the contrary of suicide. In fact, the man is the, sorry, the contrary of suicide is in fact the man condemned to death. This reminds me a bit of, of something Sartre said about freedom that is quite um, bold and maybe shocking to some people, but when you explain it, it kind of makes sense. Uh, Sartre said that we're no more or less free than the prisoner facing their execution. You know, the, the man who's tied up being marched to the guillotine to have his head hacked off is just as free as you and I are sitting here in class. It's like, what are you talking about? He's a prisoner, he's about to get killed. Well, Sartre's point is he is able to engage in that experience how he sees fit. There's an infinite amount of ways. The person that is being executed could be crying, peeing his pants, begging for mercy. Please don't kill me, I didn't do it, I swear, please, I'll never do it again. Or you know, maybe he's like a political prisoner. I fought for the country, even the France. I thought, you know, whatever, right? Like I'm dying for my countrymen with pride, with his head high. Maybe this individual, this prisoner has less possibilities. They are limited by certain things, but their capacity to assert what they think is valuable and what isn't, or how they want to interpret that situation, uh, that is completely up to them. They are absolutely free in that regard. So I think this is sort of what he's referring to when he says the contrary of suicide is the man condemned to death, right? The man facing his death is the most alive, I suppose. I don't know if that's always the case, but uh, he's making that sort of assumption. How is the man facing his death the most alive? Don't we just take life for granted most of the time? Yeah, this is, the, he talked about the body earlier uh, in the essay, talking about how the body kind of gets in the way of us ever feeling absurdity. Absurdity always comes when we're like, what's it all for? Well, the body is like telling us to eat and get some sleep and you know, that sort of thing. And so that's enough to kind of keep us going. But once our belly's full and once you've got enough sleep and we've worked a long day, maybe we're just starting to think about it. Well, what's it all for, right? 
uh, but that body sort of draws us, draws us in. But yeah, when we face our death, right? That's when we're like, oh geez, now we're really, now we really value it. That revolt gives life its value. Spread out over the whole length of life, it restores its majesty to that life. To a man devoid of blinders, right? Someone who isn't you know, blinded by hope and some form of the eternal. The man devoid of blinders, or to a man devoid of blinders, there is no finer sight uh, than that of the intelligence at grips with the reality that transcends it. The sight of human pride is unequaled. No disparagement is of any use. That discipline that the mind imposes on itself, that will conjured up out of nothing, that face-to-face -face struggle have something exceptional about them. Um, this reminds me also of Sartre when he says that this freedom is what gives us our dignity. The fact that, uh, you know, as, as Sartre puts it, we exist before we can be defined. You know, the inkwell is defined before it existed. We, we made it because we had a purpose. We have pens, we need ink and all this, but we exist and then we define ourselves. And for some of the critics of the existentialist, that is demeaning. It's like, well, we have no purpose. And, but for Sardis, it's a dignity. It's like, we're, you know, for Sardis, we're the only beings like this who exist before we can be defined. And so it makes it harder for us. It puts all the responsibility of how we're gonna define our lives on ourselves, but it, it elevates us. It gives us a certain dignity. And so I guess this is a similar point Camus is making, that living the absurd life is actually being more honest, not just that, but it sort of gives us the dignity that human beings have. Um, it doesn't impoverish our reality. Uh, I understand then why the doctrine that explains everything to me is absolute, sorry, to me also de uh, debilitates me at the same time. They relieve me of the weight of my own life, and yet I must carry it alone. Again, when I, when I fit into this script, when I fit into this mold, that does put a lot of the burden off my shoulder, right? When I decide I'm gonna join this clique and then I go to go shopping for clothes, I'm not thinking of, hmm, what do I like? Well, it looks good on me. Let me try it out and see how I feel. No, I'm like, oh, this is what my group wears, right? Gotta have the 12 hole or the whatever hole, Doc Mario, whatever that. And so I'm sort of systematically depriving myself of more opportunities and more possibilities, or like Camus would say, a quantity of experience. Um, Anyway, I'm rambling on, we're almost out of time, so I knew this was gonna happen. Uh, I got pretty close, uh, but I did not finish Camus. Um, I, luckily in the course of this lecture, I pretty much like came up with a way to tie this up pretty quick. So I think on Wednesday, we won't spend too much time on this, maybe 20, 30 minutes, and then we'll get into Nietzsche. That will probably take all class. To finish Camus, get into Nietzsche, I'll be shocked if I have a chance to start the, the novel. But it's a long book, so if you have time over the next couple of days, it wouldn't hurt to go ahead and get a head start on the novel, because we're gonna try to finish it. We, we might not finish the last chapter, which is okay, because that chapter always makes me cry, because that's, that's a chapter about the dogs. I, you know, it's hard for me to read that one. It's when, it's just when the dog dies. I don't, wanna, I don't wanna read that one. But anyways, I hope we can get through it, though, because it's a, it's a beautiful ending to the book. But anyways, that's the plan.